Rouge Radio. How you doing out there, everybody? My name is Tyler Bieber, the host of the cell portion here on the Rouge Radio, a championship edition of Rouge Radio. We're going to be talking about the Grey Cup, and then coming up here at the bottom of the hour, the CIS show, the Vanier Cup, with the guys from Sports A. It's going to be an action-packed championship edition show. Um... I'm sure you watched the Grey Cup. I mean, for the type of game that it was, and let's be honest, it was a blowout, the ratings were very good. I think they averaged 4.6 million viewers along the entire way, and for a game that was out of hand pretty much from the get-go, that had pretty good ratings for the CFL to look at. And I think you've seen over the course of the season and then you know, moving forward into the off season here and heading towards 2014 with the Ottawa Red Blacks coming back, that the CFL is starting to gain a, a lot of popularity out there. And it's huge for the league to continue to gain this type of exposure and this type of popularity. If you, know, you want to have that 10th team in the league, you want to get Atlantic Canada involved, possibly another team or something like that, and the chance for that to happen rides solely on, of course, the popularity of the league. And I think it's an encouraging sign for the CFL that things are starting to look up. You know, we're not where we were 10 years ago, where not every single game was televised on TSN, CBC, or whatnot. Every single game is televised now, televised on TSN. Um, and you got the U.S. market, the network down there, NBC Sports Network, ESPN2 and ESPN3.com this past season. Even in even in the South, you know, we've talked before about how you have to develop that market in the South to gain that extra popularity. And you have guys that are wanting to come up here and play. And these are guys that can play. You know, they're not they're guys that might just be sitting on their couch right now and not knowing that there's an option north of the border. That you, yeah, you can come up here, you can make a difference, and then you can get your shot at the NFL if need be, and you show what you can do in the Canadian Football League. We've seen it before. You know, Cameron Wake, he was cut from the NFL, came to the BC Lions, and is back in the NFL. You know, he's a great example of that type of thing. There's several more examples and several guys who try to come from the CFL to the NFL. These guys that were cut in training camp and are just trying to make it back to the National Football League. And of course, it's a little bit of a but it's, it, it's, it's tough from that regard because you, these guys do play very well in the Canadian Football League and you get accustomed to seeing them make plays week after week like a Cameron Wake in his 23 sacks a few years ago and then they go to the NFL and now you know, you're know you looking for replacements. So it's tough from that angle but at the same time these guys are wanting to get to the NFL and of course that's what you have to deal with as a CFL fan, as a general manager, a head coach, you know, a teammate, stuff like that. So, in speaking of the Grey Cup, the Hamilton Tiger Cats and the Saskatchewan Rough Riders in Regina at Mosaic Stadium, I think the general consensus going into this game was that the Saskatchewan Rough Riders were set up perfectly to win this game. You know, they're playing at home, they're playing in front of 44,000 fans, the Hamilton Tiger Cats despite it supposing to be a neutral site game, are going on the road to play the Riders in Regina. And, you know, the odds were just so stacked against the Tiger Cats that you really there's no way that Hamilton is going to win this game unless they get turnovers, you know, unless they can stop Corey Sheets, a guy who ran for 270 yards in the regular season against the Tiger Cats. In, and uh, it just didn't happen. Hamilton scored first in the game. They were up 3 nothing. But I think the time that came was that crazy fumble where Darian Durant got out of the pocket. He was going to run downfield. The ball came out. He was stripped of the football. It landed perfectly in the hands of Corey Sheets, and he rips off 41 yards or whatever it was, 39 yards, something like that, down the field. And the Scott Riders get well on their way. I believe they got a touchdown on that drive. G. Roy Simon, his first career great cup touchdown. He was playing in his fourth Grey Cup game of his career, first career Grey Cup touchdown. So, uh, you know, even a guy like G. Roy Simon, who's playing in his 15th season, still milestones to come, despite the fact that he is the leading receiver of all time in the Canadian Football League. He still has milestones that he was trying to look for, and he got that on Sunday, picking up his third Grey Cup ring in the CFL, his first with the Saskatchewan Rough Riders. Of course, the other two came with the BC Lions in 2006 
defeating the Montreal Alouettes in 2011, knocking off the Winnipeg Blue Bombers. Um, G- that was the G-Roy's first touchdown. He had two touchdowns in the game. The second one came in the second quarter. It was late in the second quarter there. Um, the Riders were driving down the field. Hamilton, again, they were struggling to get the ball moving. It was a 42-yard play. Durant found Simon down the sideline, and G-Roy Simon set some Saskatchewan Rough Rider history. You know they only have won three gate. Three great cup games, now four, but they have played in a ton more than that. And G. Roy Simon was the first player in Saskatchewan Rough Rider history to score two touchdowns in a great cup game. So there was that for him. Receiving touchdowns, I believe, as Corey Sheets also had two touchdowns in the game. Um, Darian Durant, again, I mean, we talked about it time and time again throughout the playoffs. His leadership, his ability to step up and make a play when need. 18 of 24, and 245 passing, three touchdowns. He was magnificent for the Saskatchewan Rough Riders. He fumbled the ball three times, lost one of those. But the ability to keep the football in their hands and not turn the football over, whether it's using Corey Sheets as he had 197 yards in the game, or Darian Durant himself using the ball, using his legs to move the football move the chains. He only had 26 yards in the game. But, I mean, we saw it before, right? The BC Lions game, the first game of the playoffs. And it was interesting to me because I picked the BC Lions to beat the Riders in that game, and they nearly did. And in the post game after the Great Cup and the Riders won, I was in the media room there, and Corey Chamberlain was talking, and he said directly that the BC Lions game shook them up. And they knew that at that point that if they were in another close game, they may not get out alive. So they had to play their very best football and when you look at the games against Calgary and Hamilton they did that they won and they weren't even close you know they got the seven turnovers against the Calgary Stampeders who does that you know they only had 25 turnovers the entire season I believe and they gave up to the Saskatchewan Rough Riders you know that that's something that you don't see but they got it done and now moving forward you look into the off season for the Saskatchewan North Riders coming up here. You know, is G. Roy Simon going to be back? Who are they going to protect? That type of thing. Um, another guy who had a nice game was, of course, Weston Dressler. And Weston Dressler has been a key cog for the Saskatchewan North Riders. Sometimes he seems to get lost in the light a little bit to me. You still know that he's one of the top receivers in the game, but I still don't think he gets the recognition that he deserves. And I mean, when you talk about the offseason, you look back and see what the Saskatchewan Rough Riders did the previous year to add to what eventually was a championship roster. They added Weldon Brown. He had a big game. He had an interception off of Henry Burse. Dwight Anderson, a guy who had so much consistency for the Rough Riders throughout the entire season. They added John Chick back. You know, two sacks, one forced fumble in the Grey Cup game for John Chick. They brought in other guys like Jermaine McElveen. They added Alex Hall via trade. Renald Williams, when he was healthy, was back with the Saskatchewan Rough Riders and making things happen. And uh, now moving forward with the Ottawa first draft here, the expansion draft, excuse me, it'll be interesting to see what the Riders do because, you know, you can only protect so many players. What will you do with a championship roster, and how is Brendan Tamman going to try and develop that roster to make it back to where they need to be? And that, of course, would be back-to-back Great Cups coming up in 2014 in Vancouver, the 102nd Great Cup. And you look at the flip side, the Hamilton Tiger Cats, and it still doesn't make any sense to me with C.J. Gable. They have this talented running back, runner-up for Rookie of the Year, and they still don't use him. The only reason he was even close to winning Rookie of the Year was because he had a few straight games where Kent Austin, Tommy Condell, and the Hamilton Tiger Cats gave him the ball and gave him the ball a lot. And then for whatever reason, they went away from it in the playoffs. And this is what cost the Hamilton Tiger Cats a whole bunch of wins at the beginning of the season. Their ignorance towards running the football. They didn't want to run the football Teams knew that they had to throw the football. They were able to shut down Henry Burris in that passing attack. And for that, they lost so many games that they could have won. And 
And at the end of the day, when you look back at the 2013 Hamilton Tiger Cats, that is one of the biggest reasons why they are not great cup champions, the inability to run the football. And, I mean, you look right back at the other side. You said it, Corey Sheets. He was the most outstanding player in the Grey Cup game. He had 20 carries for 197 yards and two touchdowns. He ran all over the Hamilton Tiger Cats defense. He made the job so much easier for Darian Durant to do what he needed to do. That was protect the football, manage the game, do what you got to do. And the Hamilton Tiger Cats could not help out their quarter because they, they were neglectful to run the football. You know, they, they likely should have lost earlier in the playoffs because of that, but they were able to scoop by. And because of that, you know, maybe they got it in their head that they don't need to necessarily run the football to win the Great Cup. They can probably get by on the strength of Henry Burris and his passing game. But at the end of the day, you know, you look at it and you say, well, what were you doing? Six carries is what C.J. Gable had in the Great Cup game, 23 yards, one touchdown. That came in essentially what was garbage time late in the fourth quarter when the Riders had the game well in hand. I believe the score was 45-16 at that point. Henry Burris had a rushing touchdown himself, 18 yards to open up the second half. And there was a point in time in this game where the Saskatchewan Rough Riders were up 31-6 to at the half. Hamilton comes out. You know, they, they still can't move the football, but later on in that third quarter, I believe there was about five minutes left or so, Henry Burris gets the team on a quick drive thanks to a poor punt from Ricky Schmidt, a 40-yard drive. He capped off with an 18-yard touchdown. They get the ball back. Very quickly, the Riders had a 2 and out. They get another field goal to start the fourth quarter. All of a sudden, it's a two-possession game. And you're starting to think... And I was in the press box. You can't quite get a, a volume for the noise on the outside. But every single time Hamilton started to get a first down, it was quiet. It was dead quiet. You could feel the tension. You could feel the little bit of uneasiness with the Saskatchewan Rough Rider fans. And, you know, they're just starting to think, is this going to be it? The Riders of the football, they were 2-0 and out on, a, I believe it was, Three, four, three or four straight drives. Hamilton started to rack up some points. They got 10 points in that span. But then came the time where Corey Sheets took over. And it was with about 11 minutes left in the game. And he had runs of 21 and 16. The 16-yard 16 rush broke the Grey Cup record for rushing, formerly of Johnny Bright way back when, I think it was 53 years ago or something like that, 57 years perhaps. Um, and they used Jock Sanders effectively as well. And he had a touchdown in the game. And then the knockout punch came when Durant threw a 30-yard touchdown, a 30-yard pass to Weston Dresser that set up a Corey Sheets four-yard touchdown run. And that essentially knocked any hope the Hamilton Tiger Cats had of making the comeback. At that point, it was 38-16. And then the very next play for the Hamilton Tiger Cats on offense, John Chick busts through, forces a sack. Ricky Foley recovered at the Hamilton 26. And then one play later, it was Durant to dress there again. It was a touchdown, and that was it. It was all over but the garbage time. That's when Hamilton got their touchdown. But you knew at that point that it was just a matter of time. And we went down to the tunnel with about three minutes left, and it seemed like it was going to take forever because Hamilton's trying to still score. You know, they're trying to do their best to, to make the score a little bit more respectful. And everybody in the building, you're just waiting. Every single person is just waiting for that clock to tick off and get the game over with, hand over the Grey Cup to the Saskatchewan Rough Riders. It seemed like it took about 30 minutes. Anyways, most outstanding player in the Grey Cup game, as mentioned, Corey Sheets. He had the 197 yards and two touchdowns. Most outstanding Canadian in the Grey Cup game was Chris Getzlaff, who came back for the West Final after suffering an injury earlier in the season. And uh, that was it. 45-23. The Saskatchewan Rough Riders are the 2013 Grey Cup champions, defeating the Hamilton Tiger Cats. And Overall, when you look back at the Saskatchewan Rough Riders, they were able to overcome a few things that many thought, including me, would set them back. 
and they just battled back. They got things done at the right time. And so much of professional sports, it doesn't matter if it's football, hockey, you know, you name it. So much of winning a championship is time and a timely event. And, you know, making that play at the right moment and changing the course of history. And the Fiction Rough Riders, time and time again this season, I think, did that. You know, they got out to the hot start. And everybody was already saying, hey, the Great Cup's in Regina. These guys are well ahead of everybody. They're looking like the best team in years in the CFL. They're going to blow out the competition. You know, there was even a little bit of, we'll call it silly talk, but there was a little bit of a perfect record talk out there. Um, Then it came crashing down for a little bit. They got on a losing streak. They were able to find it. They lost to the Winnipeg Blue Bombers in the Banjo Bowl, but they were able to bounce back, get things done, get Corey Sheets back in the lineup. He helped bring that added sustainability in the running game back to the offense, and then they just took off in the playoffs. And as I mentioned it before, you know, if you saw my columns on CFL.ca or else on CFLDaily.ca, Darian Durant time is what I label it, and that is the playoff season, and he seems to just come out of his shell. And no matter what he did in the regular season, he just pops right out, says, here I am, this is what I'm going to do to your defense, and he goes and does it. He's done it before. Even though he didn't win a great cup until this season, he got them to two on this kind of not turning the football over, being that leader, using his legs when necessary, doing what it takes to get a first down, to keep a drive moving, to waste more time off the clock. And his playoff performance truly amazed me. And I know that now you have to be convinced, if you're a fan of the Saskatchewan Rough Riders, that Darian Durant is your guy. I mean, what more can you say? Before, the argument could have been he hasn't won a great cup for your team yet. You can't say that anymore. Darian Durant is a great cup champion. He was before in 2007 as a backup, but now he's got it himself as that starting quarterback. He is a great cup champion. You can't say anything else about the guy that tear him down. And then you look at the other quarterback, Henry Burris. He's starting to get towards the tail end of his career. He is a free agent coming up this offseason. It's going to be so interesting to see what the Hamilton Tiger Cats do at quarterback. So interesting. Do you do you re-sign Henry Burris? Do you let him walk as a free agent? Do you protect Dan Lefevre? I think I would protect Dan Lefevre. I mean, you know if you listen to the show right how big of a fan I am of Dan Lefevre. I think he can do great things in the time and Tommy Condell run out there in Hamilton. And then you let Henry Burris go and you see what happens from there. Henry Burris is a tremendous quarterback. He's one of the greatest quarterbacks of all time in the Canadian Football League. But there comes a point in time where you just have to move on and try something else. And Henry Burris may go to, say, Ottawa next season and still be able to do something. But by Hamilton Tiger Cats, you have to have that contingency plan to move on and know that you're doing what you need to do in the future. And I'm not sure Henry Burris is a part of that plan. And then if you're the Ottawa Red Blacks, do you want a 38-year-old quarterback? Do you have a spot on your team for a 38-year-old quarterback? And if so, how how much do you want to pay him if you're not going to start him? And this is why this is going to be the greatest offseason probably in CFL history. And, I mean, it's easy to say that, but you look at everything that could possibly happen, and it's mind-blowing. I mean, this Ottawa Reds team is going to be so good from the start and the moves that they can make, the guys that they could acquire pending on who gets protected, is just incredible. And we're going to have a, a show dedicated to the Ottawa Red Blacks coming up at a later date, hopefully before the expansion draft, maybe even after. But uh, we'll talk about it more then. But I'm, I'm excited to see what happens with this Ottawa Red Blacks team. I really am. I'm excited to see what Marcel Desjardins does with the head coach, who the coaching staff is, who the players are going to be. It's going to be an awesome time, an awesome off season for the CFL, and you have got to be looking forward to it, regardless of what team you are a fan of. It's going to be a great off season for the CFL. 
speaking of Ottawa head coaches, you know that talk is going on. Um, earlier today, Chris Jones was announced as the head coach of the Edmonton Eskimos, replacing Kavis Reed. And I think you look at what Chris Jones can bring. They're both defensive guys, but. Kavis Reed, here's the thing with Kavis Reed. He always talked about consequences. And I'm using air quotes when I say that. Because you can't exactly take Kavis Reed at face value for saying consequences when you look at that team and they won as few games as they did. You know, where are the consequences for a football team that time and time again just could not get it done? There's no consequences there. If there were consequences there, you might have a more of a winning season. To me, it was all talk with Cave Street. And what Chris Jones can bring is accountability. And Chris Jones is going to be the guy who gets in your face and tells you what you need to do to improve yourself and why you need to do it. And you're going to listen to him because that's the guy he is and he knows what's best for you as a football player. And there are so many good pieces on the Edmonton Eskimos defense that he can work with and make a huge impact immediately. And we always talk about these guys who have been coordinators for the longest of time and finally get their shot at head coach. Now, Chris Jones is a little bit younger than guys like George Cortez and Greg Marshall who got their shot when they were well, well, well experienced over the age of 50. Uh, Tim Burke with the Winnipeg Blue Bombers is another example. But Chris Jones can breathe some fire into that Edmonton Eskimos team, bring some passion to that football club, and I think that's the exact kind of thing the Edmonton Eskimos are needing. And not to say Kavis Reed couldn't do that, because I think one of Kavis Reed's best attributes was his ability to motivate And the guys want to play for you. But you still need to hold them accountable. And I think Kavis Street let them off the hook a little bit too much and didn't really live up to what he said he needed to do as a head coach to improve the football team. So it'll be very interesting to see how Chris does with the Edmonton Eskimos. The other other coaching change that is about to happen, the BC Lions... Offensive coordinator Jacques Chapdelaine will not be back with the team. His contract expires at the end of this season. They announced today a mutual agreement to part ways. Chapdelaine will be a free agent on the market for a team looking to scoop up an offensive coordinator who has years of experience in the CFL. And, you know, I'm the biggest fan of Jacques Chapdelaine when he's been with the BC Lions. I thought he did a tremendous job late this season to turn around an offense that was clearly struggling. And the addition of Stefan Logan was huge towards that. But at the end of the day, the consistency just was not there. And not at a level it needed to be if you're going to have a championship offense. And while the BC Lions very nearly got to the Western Final, and if they did, probably could have made it to this Grey Cup game. It came back to the offense and their ability to be consistent, and it just was not there. You know, we talked so much before about Andrew Harris, the talented Canadian running back that they have on that roster, and the inability of Jacques Chapdelin to use him. And it never made any sense. And you can talk so much about how good quarterback Travis Lule is and how good of receiver Sean Gore is. And Nick Moore, Emmanuel Arsenal, all the weapons that Travis Lule has at his disposal. But you still need to have that running game. And they just didn't use it effectively enough. Now, like I said, they started to pick up on it when Stefan Logan got there. But at that point, you still couldn't get it together. And that's what it came down to, the consistency to have an offense that week in and week out is going to win you a football game if defense lets you down. And for Jacques Chapdelin and the BC Lions, it just was not there. Now, I think Jacques Chapdelin can certainly help an offense 
I mean, he's proven it. The BC Lions were the top-ranked offense in 2012. Won a great cup in 2011 with Sheptelin as the coordinator. So he can certainly help a team that's looked for a veteran and some experience in that offense. But he's just not the guy anymore for the BC Lions. And you look at the options. You have Paul Lapolis there. Paul Lapolis would do great things with Travis Lule in that offense. I'll tell you what, if they get Paul Lapolis, people might start to look at the BC Lions as an early favorite for the Great Cup in 2014, playing again at home. Other options, you know, not saying it for any specific reason, but George Cortez is out there. You know, there's, there's not really any rumor or speculation that he's going to leave the Saskatchewan Rough Riders. But there's an option. He has some familiarity with Wally Buono. So it'll be interesting what the BC Lions do at offensive coordinator and their quest to improve that offense. And, you know, overall, when you look at the coaches and the potential moves that could come about here, Doug Barry's already gone with the Montreal Alouettes. They're, again, there's speculation that perhaps Paul Lapolis might be with the Montreal Alouettes as an offensive coordinator or that they have at least contacted him. It all comes right back to the Ottawa Red Blacks. Is Paul Lapolis going to get a shot to be the head coach with the Ottawa Red Blacks? Could Jacques Chapdelin be that guy for Ottawa? What's going to happen with the Winnipeg Blue Bombers? There's been speculation that it's going to be Kahari Jones as the head coach, and if it is, you may be expecting an announcement sometime soon. And it all ties back into that interesting offseason that's going to come about in the Canadian Football League. What do you think is going to happen? I'd be curious to know your thoughts. You can email me, cfldaily at email.com. We are on Facebook, Rouge Radio. Look us up on there. Of course, the always reliable and tremendously valuable social media tool at CFL Daily at Rouge Radio. Who would you pick to be the head coach of the Ottawa Red Blacks? What would you look for in an offensive coordinator with the BC Lions? And do you think Chris Jones is the kind of head coach that the Edmonton Eskimos need to bring that franchise back from back-to-back misses in the playoffs and to that respectful program that we used to see in the days of Hugh Campbell, Ricky Ray, Danny Machocha was even there for a great cup. Is Chris Jones the right guy for the Edmonton Eskimos? You tell me. I think he will be. But I'm always curious to hear your thoughts as well. So please do hit us up that way. As always, it's a little bit <laughs> it's a little bit late for this now, but uh, you can always call in for the weekly shows. 347-989-1127 is the number to call. Skype is a useful tool as well. You can sco- Skype, scop. You can scop us, Skype us. Various ways to contact us here at Rouge Radio. How about your thoughts on the Ottawa Red Blacks? And this is another segment. I'm not sure if it's going to tie in directly with our devoted program to the Ottawa Red Blacks that will come up here. But would you protect, if you had an option on your favorite team to keep away from the Ottawa Red Blacks, who would you be willing to dangle and risk possibly losing to Ottawa in order to keep somebody else. Rouge Radio. CFL edition. Look for us throughout the entire off season. Where else are you going to find that kind of coverage? We'll be with you every Wednesday leading up to the 2014 Canadian Football League season. You're not going to find that anywhere else, I guarantee you. 
So please be sure to tune in every Wednesday. We'll be right here. Myself, Tyler Beaver, being the host. Be glad to have you on the program. We'd love to hear from you. That's going to do it for the CFL portion of Rouge Radio, a division of sports. Hope you enjoyed this championship version. Hi, everyone, and welcome to the CIS Football Roundup here on Rouge Radio, presented by SportsAid.ca. My name is James Katsuris. I'm the chief editor at SportsA, and as always, I'll be your host for this episode. This week, we'll be discussing Laval's Vanier Cup victory over the Calgary Dinos last weekend in Quebec City, 25-14, of course. We'll talk about the CIS All-Canadian announcements and major award winners from last week before the game. And we'll give our final thoughts on the season that was, uh, just wrap it up a bit, and uh, give some early predictions for 2014, because we all know it's never too early for that. Uh, joining me on the show, as always, is Sports A Vice President and former receiver for the McGill Redmond, Zachary Miller, as well as Top Prospects Operations Manager and former McGill running back, Neil Sakar. Guys, thanks for coming out. No problem, brother. Howdy. All right, so uh, it was the game we were all waiting for, so we might as well just jump right into it. Uh, we'll kick off the show with the Vanier Cup, uh, which Zach and myself were fortunate enough to attend and to soak in the unbelievable atmosphere. Uh, I mean, I'll start off by asking you, Zach, uh, did you, I, I mean, I know you were expecting it to be crazy, but were you expecting it to be uh, like it was? Um, not really, actually. I was thoroughly impressed. It was a great environment. Um, the Laval fans obviously love football. They love their team. Um and, you know, they're all out there tailgating a few hours before the game. When the game started, they had jet planes flying over over top. It was crazy. Like, I wanted to put on the pads and get out there. Like, the environment was great. Um, I'm really fortunate, like, that I got to go out and experience that. I hope everyone can at some point if they love football. It really was amazing. They did a great job hosting, uh, you know, the Laval staff. It was excellent. A stadium that seats over 12,000. They had over 18,000. I think it was, like, 18,500 fans on hand standing room only. They were there hours before the game, drinking, uh, having a good time, and uh, truly an amazing atmosphere. So let's uh, let's start analyzing the game, though. Uh, the final score was 25-14, but in reality, it could have been a lot more lopsided if it weren't for some early holding calls against Laval, if Boris Bidet hadn't uncharacteristically missed some field goals, and if they capitalized on the early field position because they were having their way moving the ball down the field. How did you feel about that, Zach? Well, yeah, you said it. Like, early on, you saw Laval was running the ball heavily. They had success. They had that big run by Boutin. Uh, I think that was in the first quarter, and um, they got called back on a hold, which I, at that point, I thought, okay, well, here goes Laval. But it got called back, and, you know, they couldn't seem to find the end zone at that point until later on in the game. Um, Calgary did, you know, hang in there and, you know, props to them. But I think, yeah, of course, it could have been a little more lopsided. Ryu had a big punt return that was called back on a hold as well. Um, and, you know, like just middle Val made a, a few more mistakes than they usually do, actually. And uh, um, they still were able to pull it out, which just shows the great coaching um, and how great of a team it actually is that can hold it together throughout the whole game, you know. Um, they've been able to do it all year. And, uh, you know, Calgary's a younger team, so... Um, they obviously, Laval had the advantage, but, um, you know, uh, they pulled it out in the end. Now, I know losing any game is tough, but obviously a game like this, uh, you know, you can't even put it into words. But, I mean, I fully expected Calgary, you know, such a young team, traveling across the country in this unbelievable atmosphere. They're not used to anything like it. There was 16,000 more fans than they're what they're used to uh, getting in their stadium. You know, I mean, they could have very easily just packed it in. They could have easily gotten blown out, but... 25-14, and, and they were winning in the fourth quarter. I mean, they were winning at one point, right, when they got that second touchdown. Uh, can they take anything away? Like, I, obviously they could take something away, but is this a moral victory for Calgary? I know they lost, and I know they don't want to hear that, but is, is it a moral victory for them to have played, you know, the, the champs, the defending champs so close in Laval? Well, I don't think uh, moral victories really exist in football, but there's definitely positives they can take away from it. Um, that game, it, to me, looked. I was watching on TV, I wasn't there, but – it looked a lot like the way Montreal plays Laval. Going into halftime, it's close. Uh, it came down to a lot of special teams, like we had kind of predicted. Did Laval score a touchdown before 
the no, first half? No, like they didn't. So it looked a lot like the way Montreal plays them. Not many teams can say they didn't give up a touchdown to Laval in the first half. So I don't think it's a moral victory. I don't really believe in that. But there's certainly positives they can take away from it. Their young team, going back, now they, they, know, they know what the top of the CIS looks like now. And they fought. They battled. They did, so they did reasonably well. So I think on that level, they can definitely take away positives. I think to add on that, like the uh, the young environment, they played with heart, um, and I think that's the biggest thing they could take away. You could see that this team had heart. They never gave up. They were in Laval, playing Laval at home, who hasn't lost a game since 2004 at home. Like the weather wasn't great either. Every time Calgary's offense went on the field, I haven't heard a louder crowd in CS football. It was ridiculous. Like. I don't know how they got the playoffs at the time. They didn't make that many mistakes, actually. There's a couple of fumbles, I know, uh, by the offense. But uh, overall, I think what they can take away is that they battled. And, you know, moving forward, they'll have a lot of those core guys back, and they'll be able to make another run no problem. I Personally, I think this game was a microcosm of Laval season. I don't think it was just the way Calgary played them or the way Montreal plays them. I think this the way this Laval team is built, they're built on defense, so nobody can score on them early but they don't have a passing game. Like, they have good receivers. Their O-line is obviously ridiculous, but they haven't had a good quarterback play this year, so they couldn't really put teams away that were good that challenged them early, but they wore them down with that strong running game where you throw in three running backs that could start for any other team and three all-Canadian offensive linemen. And so you have these close battles with teams that are throwing their all at Laval, but then in the second half, they just run out of gas and they just run all over them. But uh, that leads me into my next point, actually. What do you think was the biggest factor in this game. What was the biggest difference? And for me, like I said, I think it was Laval's line on both the offensive side of the ball and the defensive side of the ball. I think three All-Canadians on the O-line, all on the right side, center Pierre Labertou, Charles Valliancourt, right guard, and right tackle Carl Lavoie. And then on the D-line, you have Vincent Deloge, who had eight sacks in four playoff games and then eight and a half sacks in eight games of the regular season. So, I mean, what the heck? This guy just absolutely terrorized the opposing quarterbacks. And then, of course, Brandon Tenant, who was second-team All-Canadian. I think Calgary hadn't seen anything like that all year. I, I, they didn't have the size to compete with that. What do you guys think? It's true. It's, it's just the experience and the size on the lines. Um, I think Blake Neal said it himself. It was a game of the lines. Like, they battled. They're a young team, but in the end, you know, a young O-line playing against an experienced D-line is just not going to happen. A young D-line playing against an O-line of that caliber against Laval, not going to happen. And you could tell... In the fourth quarter, I think they maybe threw one pass. They ran the ball every single play, and Calgary could not stop them every single play. And it's just it's what they have to do at that point to seal the victory, and they did it exceptionally well. Well, Niels, why did Laval even attempt a single forward pass this game based on the way that like, they literally picked up a first down every time they ran the ball? Why did they even attempt? A, 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 they went into a lull at one point when Calgary came back because they were trying to throw it. They were going for the, you know, the long second down throw or even first down throw, and it was always incomplete, and that's what kept – uh, Calgary in the game, I felt. That, well, that kind of like that happens in football games generally. When okay, they were getting first downs, but they weren't scoring. You kind of stick, you you stray away from your game plan a bit, and then you, the natural tendency is always to go to the air, right? Because you can make some big games quickly like that. Um, but in the end, they, I mean, they so that's understandable that they did that, but then they really did go back to the run, and it served them well. Is is this a matter of sometimes coaches just overthinking things, just thinking too much? For sure, I think. Um, but, you know, the great coaches, you know, know what works in the end, and they constantly went back to it. Uh, they ran the ball. When they were throwing the ball, actually, that's you said Calgary made that run. Um, they had a great play where uh, uh, they forced a fumble on Al Skinner, blindside hit, huge hit, fumbled the ball, they recovered it, Calgary came back, and I'm pretty sure they scored a touchdown on that drive. So they made, you know, they made a great comeback at that point, but the Laval – Bench saw what was going on, and they made the right call and just went back to the run. And I don't, I don't know if it's like the coach is getting – I don't know what it is. I think it's a little bit of panic setting. And when a coach goes from like from off the game plan to the air, it's almost like a little bit of panic. And the fact that Calgary might – I don't, I can't say this for sure, but might have instilled that feeling in Glenn Constant is a, a massive victory on some level. Yeah. No other coaches can really – or teams have been able to do that. They don't stray away from the game plan. They don't make mistakes. When Laval makes mistakes, it's not that they're screwing up, it's that you're forcing them to make mistakes. So Calgary did that too. The only other team I've seen do that, Laval, in recent years is Montreal. Okay, guys, a player who ran rough shot on opposing defenses all year was held quiet the entire game, and that might have been the difference. Mercer Timmis, why was he shut out? How did Laval do it? And do you think this game affects his standing in CFL scouts' eyes at all? 
Um, I don't think so at all. When you saw, if you watched the game, you would see that pretty much at, almost every time he got a hand up, he was hit at least once in the backfield before he went down. He was breaking tackles left and right, trying to make plays. One point he reversed the field, breaking three or four tackles, but almost every single time he was getting hit in the backfield. So I think he actually did a great job of giving his team a chance. Um, he had a, a great screen pass uh, from Buckley at one point where he trucked a, a Laval uh, cornerback and it was, you know, got the team hyped up. They scored on that drive. And, uh, you know, he still made plays and he's, for sure, he's still a great running back, no doubt. But it's just the old, I think it was the old line's experience at that point. They were overwhelmed with the D line. He had never seen a D line like that. And more importantly, I don't think his offensive line had seen, gone against an op- opposing D line that, that good. I think it's that simple. Two players for Calgary that had unbelievable games and young players in their careers. Andrew Buckley's first season starting. I thought he was amazing. I thought when uh, Timmis couldn't get the run game going, he was improvising. Uh, you know, with his arm, obviously he was making plays, but then he was scrambling too and picking up first downs. And then another guy who just had his breakout game, I guess, and you know he has to be on everybody's watch for next year. Jake Hardy led them in receiving, had that amazing touchdown run. He had a couple of uh, or that costly fumble, but at the same time, without him, they're not in that game at all. So. Uh, you know, two players that really kept uh, Calgary in the game. Uh, this Buckley kid's gonna be good. I know. I, what did the uh, someone was saying that he might go to medical, medical school? Yeah. I don't know. So if that affects, well, it wouldn't affect his eligibility, but if he yeah. might have different priorities going in the future. But he didn't. Everyone's talking about Alex Skinner, how he wasn't the starter this year coming in. He's only played seven CIS games. This Buckley kid, yeah. he was a rookie, not a rookie, but first time yeah. starting, yeah. looked so good under pressure. Back the Western game, absolutely nailed it. All his throws were on point. Looked like a, a fourth year, fifth year starter. And in this game, I mean, it was a different team going against Laval, but he still looked great. He he looked great against Laval. He didn't make many mistakes. I thought he was making the right decisions all game. Like he didn't throw an interception, which is first off a great uh, a great thing for a quarterback. You don't want to be turning over the ball. But then he would tug the ball and ran, he ran when he had to. Right? He ran for. Uh, 82 yards, averaging 10 yards a carry. When they needed a first down, on like on second down, sometimes he tugged the ball, ran first down against so, Laval. This is against Laval. Laval. So he made right decisions in a very hostile environment, which shows you know the kid is ready to start. He's a starter, and uh, so it's going to be interesting going into next year, um, seeing with uh, Eric back uh, the starter, the starters back for Calgary. Um, he was actually on the sidelines cheering his team on. Great, uh, great to see him there. But it's going to be interesting to see what happens next year with Calgary's quarterback situation. Yeah, apparently he was healthy enough to play, but Coach Nill didn't want him to, so he could save a year of eligibility, so that in the event that uh, Buckley goes to med school, he'll have at least one of his two quarterbacks for next year. Um, game MVPs, I think Vincent Deloge was pretty much a no-brainer. Pascal Locard, or Lochard, sorry, for uh, Laval. I mean, honestly, you could have given it to anyone on the O-line. You could have given it to Guillaume Rieu, who's, you know, the most dynamic spark plug, you know, in the CIS. And Maxime Boutin, I guess, is more of the closer because he finished with more rushing yards, but he closes, whereas Lochard was just picking up a first down every time he rushed the ball in the first half and early in the second half. Do you guys agree with him getting the MVP? I think so, yeah. He scored the touchdown for them. Even though Boutin did, there was a holding call. But I do agree. You honestly could have gave it to Boutin as well, but they both rushed for 190 yards. Boutin had his glory last year, right? He had yeah. that 220-yard game it's, coming in and gets the last year. So. Definitely. Look at well. He he deserved it. Played a great game. Scored a touchdown. Um, really, you know, he deserved it for sure. Okay, guys, a quick discussion on where do you think the 50th Vanier Cup should be hosted next year? Toronto. Every year. <laughs> I guess, let's make it a neutral position. It's halfway through the country, essentially. The only, I guess, complaint you would have is that the Ontario team is pretty much get a home field advantage then. But, I mean, if you have it out in D.C., someone's going to go travel all the way across the country. If you have it out east, I don't even know if they have a stadium big enough to do it. So then, I guess, yeah, Montreal, Quebec City is another one pretty central, but then it's such a hostile environment. If you have a game at the Rogers Center, last year was McMaster playing uh, Laval. It was not necessarily a Mac home crowd. I was at the game. It was pretty split. Mm -hmm. So if you have it at Laval, it really is going to be a Laval home turf. I think at the Rogers Center, I mean, it's the best venue. Last year, it, it was a packed house. It was, it was great. It's, it's a little big. Obviously, you're not going to fill, fill the stadium. But I think Toronto is, is a good place. Also, another thing to consider is, like a lot of people are talking about, follow, following the, the Great Cup, wherever it is, paired up with the Vanier Cup. You know, it rotates around the country. It doesn't necessarily give any teams an advantage. It's, it would probably be neutral. And uh, it might be injecting some programs um, in those areas with funds that they may not have had uh, 
if they didn't host the Vanier Cup, right? That's another great point, because last year that was half the reason why it was so, like, it worked out so well in mm-hmm. Toronto, because the Great Cup was there. The whole weekend becomes, like, a big festive kind of thing, and you have a back-to-back. All the TV crews are set up. It was the best coverage I've ever seen of a, a Vanier Cup last year. Um, I think, yeah, that, that's actually a great idea. Okay, guys, and uh, finally, very quickly, because this could obviously be a much bigger topic, a much bigger discussion, Laval has now won two Vanier Cups in a row for the second time. Uh, they did it in the early 2000s, and eight of the last 15. Is that accomplishment the most impressive accomplishment in CIS sports? Is it more impressive than Carlton men's basketball, nine championships in 11 years, for example? Can you even compare the two? I think you can compare them. Um, I don't know about saying which one's better, but Laval has been dominant. 100% since they came in the league. There's like, uh, how long have they been in the league? 20-odd years, 90, right? Really 90. 20 odd years. Like, they have dominated throughout since they've been a program in the CIS. So, you know, you take that into consideration. Um, they're not the oldest program. But I don't know if you compare it to Carlton. Either way, it's dominance, and they're a dynasty. Um, no one has challenged Laval um, consistent enough to, you know, have a new champion every year. But I think it, we're, we're getting to that point slowly, slowly. I don't know why, like, any – how old the program has to do – well, I don't know why older is better. Everyone likes to argue that Western Queens have been around for so many years. So you That means you've won less, more like, at least percentage of the time you've been around. So the fact that they've done it in such a short span, I think, like, lends credence to the fact that it's more amazing. Comparing it to Carlton, Apples and Oranges with basketball, I'll try to say um, – it's certainly impressive. I guess the bigger question, though, is it good or bad for the sport? I think a lot of people say it's good. It's, I think it's good to an extent. Uh, but there's a certain point when, like, you do want to see some more parity throughout the league. Um, but is it – it's one of those things. Is, does it, is it make us, making us transition through a couple of years of this, and then we'll break through and achieve that? Or is it just making the gap wider and wider? I don't know. I don't think it's making the gap wider. Uh, I think we're getting to a point where programs are starting to – invest a bit more into the football programs. Um, but we're not really going to find that out for another couple of years, and uh, I hope the, that is the case instead of the gap getting wider because that if the gap is getting wider, obviously it's not great. For but could, could we have said that in 2005? We could have. You know what I mean? You know, we had a couple of new champions, and then Laval all of a sudden is back on top. So you never know, right? It's, it, that's the thing about college football as well. It's always rotating, you know, the play, new players coming in every two, three years, every four years. So um, it's hard to predict, but we'll see going forward. Parity is obviously uh, more entertaining and what fans want to see, but I think the best thing for any sport, the healthiest thing for a sport, the way for it to truly grow, is to have someone who is always setting the bar higher and higher and higher because that forces, forces everybody else to catch up. So right now, people not, might not be happy seeing the same team win it over and over again, but it's forcing everybody else to compete with them. So And that, that can only be a good thing. So... Uh, so that will wrap up our discussion of the Vanier Cup. Uh, the CIS All-Canadian uh, Banquet was last week in Quebec City as well, and the All-Canadians and Major Award winners were announced. Uh, if you guys have, well, first the rundown, Heather obviously won the Heck Crichton, pa- Pavel Kruba won Defensive Player of the Year, uh, Laurent Duvernay-Tardif, the Alignment Award, Danny Vandervoort, uh, Best Wide Receiver, or sorry, Best Rookie of the, sorry, rookie of the Year, Andrew Buckley won the Russ Jackson, and Kevin McKee won Coach of the Year. Uh, was there anything uh, that you guys, I don't know, that, that you disagreed with in terms think, of those picks? I think that all made sense. Um, there might be some controversy at the heck crying people were talking about, but I think they made the right decision there. Um, he was deserving of it. Uh, and everyone else, great job. They were all deserving, especially Vandervoort. He, was, he dominated this year as a rookie, and I think he deserves a lot of credit for that. Going back to the heck crying, I think, now, in retrospect of looking at what happened with Calgary, Laval, and Western, I think it was the obvious choice now is Heather. Um, after seeing, you know, what, what Calgary did to Western, and then the whole time we were saying, well, Finch, because the stats were roughly equal, equal, right? So then we put them, who would play in the tougher division? After seeing what Western, you know, got handed to by Calgary, that makes me question the whole OUA, the bottom feeders, at least. And then I think it's obvious now that Heather was playing against much better opponents the whole year. So I also just have to give a quick shout-out to him. He's from New Brunswick. Mm-hmm. Grew up in the same area as him. Um, another thing I would like to point out, I think not only is he the best Canadian football player in, in the university right now, um, but probably the most improved player over the last six years or so. He didn't – He I played against him in high school. Good quarterback, threw a great ball. Came in to Bishop's um, – 
not necessarily like with a lot of hoopla. He wasn't like the next big thing and worked his butt off and got to the starting position and now is in his final year is the best player in the country. So hats off to Jordan Heather. Incredible job, bud. And another thing, and not to discredit, uh, you know, what Mercer Timmis means to Calgary, because obviously, you know, the fact that Laval had to account for him means that it opened up a lot of things for everybody else, even though he didn't have his numbers. But Calgary is a great team, even without him. I mean, Buckley did amazing. The receivers did a great job, right? Timmis had less than 100 yards from scrimmage. He had 33 rushing yards. He had that one long reception. And they still hung with Laval and almost beat them in Laval. So at the end of the day, if you look at valuable, I guess, I mean, that just shows that, uh, you know, maybe he wasn't as valuable to his team as Heather was to the Gators. Absolutely. And in all honesty, Mercer Timmis and Will Finch will win this trophy in the next three years. They'll each probably get it. Probably, probably get it if they stay on pace. I mean, they're both incredible athlete, athletes. Yeah. So for me, as, uh, going in, I thought, you know, Mercer Timmis maybe was the leader for me. And then it was a battle between Jordan Heather and Will Finch. I think now looking back as well, Jordan Heather is a clear winner. And then Mercer Timmis, I think, and then Will Finch, because you could argue that Will Finch padded the stats against some questionable teams in the OUA. Okay, guys, very quickly, because we're running out of time, uh, I want you guys to tell me if you have any issue with who was named an All-Canadian or who should have been named All-Canadian. I'll start off with uh, who I felt. Uh, I don't know how nobody from the Montreal Carabin, uh gets an All-Canadian nod when that team finished second in the country in points per game, first in sacks, and second in rush yards per game. How did no one from that D-line, how did – David Menard, how did Matthew Girard, how did Jean Saint Blanc, who were all near the top of the CIS in sacks, how did none of them get not even a second All Canadian nod? Uh, to me, that doesn't make a lot of sense. So that's that's the issue I would take with that. What about you guys? Yeah, I agree, but at the same time, it's it's the All Canadian is really like an individual award. So when you have a team that's like when your D line is so good as a unit, it might be harder to pick out one guy. So it, it is kind of uh, a snuff that none of them made it, but at the same time, it might actually lend credence to the fact that as a unit, they were so good. Very quickly, guys, who do you take issue with anybody not being named an All-Canadian? Um, I'm looking at the second team right now. Running backs, I see, not to take anything away from anyone, but I don't see uh, Brandon Deschamps' name there, and that's disappointing to me. Um, I think he was well-deserving of it. Uh, he was the third um Second leading rusher, he was second in the country in rushing, um, second in yards per game, six touchdowns. He was very valuable to his UBC team, who played Calgary well in uh, the semifinals. Um, and uh, maybe his receiving yards weren't as good as Galander's, but I think he got snubbed from the Canada West All-Star team. He deserved a second-team All-Canadian nod, playing with two of the other great running backs in the CIS, in Coombs and Timmis out west. Um, I think he, he definitely got snubbed there. Yeah, and uh, I guess Nick Anapolsky, obviously, uh, for me, that's a big snub set the, the record for catches in a season. And then Tay Wynn from the AUS was a great linebacker that I felt uh, got snubbed. So we'll move on now. Final thoughts on the season. I, I just want to mention something really quick, something interesting. I think Queens has been a fantastic team under uh, Pat Sheehan since he took over, and I think they've had tremendous success. But uh, I recently looked and saw that they've, they only have one Yates Cup since uh, 2000, the one they won in uh, 2009. Do you feel like they've underachieved? Even though like they consistently finish as one of the top teams in the OUA, uh, I, we, I think we go on a big tangent on this one. But um, we even made—I'll I'll admit it—we made a mistake in the early season, putting out our preseason. Pre- yeah, but no one knows preseason. No, I know. So hard to say. You know, we. But the thing is, just to defend our preseason ranking here, we put Queens number one, looking at the fact that their team was completely veteran. They had no reason. I think no reason to lose to Western the way they did. Um, but their team resembled that 2009 team, I think, in and out. You could have even argued it was, it might have been a little bit better. But um, looking, looking back, um, I think Queens has underachieved as recently. Um, um, but hopefully next season we could see a little turnaround here. Uh, no, they haven't underachieved. They've achieved exactly how good they should have. They're an average team in a mediocre league. Okay, guys, well, unfortunately, that's all we have time for here on your weekly CIS Football Roundup on Rouge Radio. Make sure to check out sportsday.ca for the latest commentary on CIS football and CIS basketball, as well as high school football and basketball. Also, be sure to check out rougeradio.com for our latest episodes and CFL talk. We'll be back next week for more CIS football discussion. I've been your host, James Katsuris, joined by Zach Miller and Neil Stakar. See you guys next time.